Hi people, so that's a pretty bright screen. Um, I'm directly under the light in this room, so hopefully it's not too distracting. And hopefully the sound is okay. Um, I've taken to checking the sound before I record any video now because of previous problems. Um, I, I've just completed another book, and like the last one I've completed, which was about the uh, regicide of the Romanovs in Russia in 1918, uh, this is also about a harrowing historic event, um, and it's this book, An Ordinary Man, all Um the true story behind Hotel Rwanda. Now, I'm a slow reader, it's not a particularly thick book, it's about 265 pages, and it's, um, it, it's quite a good paced book, you know, some books are very long-winded. Um, it's well written, it's a biographical book by Rusipagina. Uh, but largely about the genocide, and it's uh, co-written by Tom Solner, and I highly recommend it. Um, but having completed this, it brought me to uh, videos about the, the um, legal proceedings that have taken place against this man. Um, in 2020, he was uh, arrested um, and charged with terrorism offences in Rwanda, which... Um, for anyone who's read this book or anyone who knows about this man is, is extraordinary. This is a guy who's been known as the Schindler of Africa. Um, if you don't know the story, basically, uh, he was a hotel manager in Kigali and during the genocide, he helped through a range of, um, dealings, contacts, bribery, um, and wit to protect over 1,200 people. Uh, Tutsis and moderate Hutus, basically from certain death, um, and to many he's a hero. What's striking about the book is his humility. But anyway, um, he was arrested in 2020, and it's widely thought that this was basically an act of uh, political repression by the Kagame regime in Rwanda, on the grounds that uh, Rusa Subagina, um formed a political party, and he's been outspoken against. Kagame as as a president um, and I think this warrants a bit of discussion because it isn't just it hasn't just got reverberations in Rwanda but more broadly speaking for other potential genocides around the world um, most of the book details the events in the Mills Colleen's hotel in 1994 the last few chapters are quite striking uh, two years after the genocide, around 1996, he um, and his family went to Brussels and he settled there. Uh, he became a, he started a taxi business because his contract with the Sabina Hotel had ended. So he started a taxi business um, and yeah, uh, he's basically, he settled in Brussels. Um, he also had a second home in San Antonio, Texas and in 2020, he was uh, brought on a private jet from San Antonio to Burundi on false premises and ended up in Rwanda on these charges. Now, the critical thing about this and what Amnesty International and observers have said is that this trial lacked any due process. There were serious flaws. If they genuinely believed that this man was a threat, they could have extradited him. Um, but there's pretty much no evidence to that effect at all. That the idea that he's funded a terrorist organization. I think the truth is Paul Kagame is a dictator, and like all dictators, he doesn't like criticism. This is uh, in the in the Rwanda uh, excuse me Rwanda context. It's worth a little bit more note because Kagame has done some good things, and even uh, Paul Rutus again acknowledges this in his book. Um, you know, he's uh, Kagami's an ethnic Tutsi, but one of the first things his government done was got rid of the ID cards, um, which were hated. And this was widely applauded because those ID cards differentiate between Tutsi and Hutu. So getting rid of that was a good thing. Uh, his government started reconciliation programs and granted some of them are forced, but that's very important. Um, on, on his watch, Rwanda's economy has increased greatly. It's even been called uh, Switzerland of Africa. And there's clearly a lot of potential there. That's why when the British government, you know, has proposed 
to resettle refugees in Rwanda. They've they've cited these sort of things that it isn't the hellhole that it's made out to be. Um, I think certainly it's important to look at where Rwanda was during the genocide. This this mass grave. I mean, it's a small country. Um, to think of what was going on in those days versus the situation now, clearly it's much much better. But um, what Rusasipagina argues in his closing chapters is about complacency and about not being complacent. So what Kagami's achieved can also be lost by by the fact he's basically a dictator. I think the danger is without having political plurality in Rwanda, um, it will breed resentments. Um, even one of the, there was an interesting interview on Journeyman, um, on the Journeyman channel, where even one of the editors of one of the free channels supports Kanagami and says these measures are necessary. Rwanda is not ready uh, to be a full democracy, um, essentially, that's not verbatim. Um, and he made a good point, which was that during the genocide, uh, absolute free speech, um, that is to say the Hutu power radio stations, directly had a role in the genocide. Now, this is a powerful pushback or a powerful, uh, let's say, rebuttal against those who would argue for absolute free speech. Because if you have absolute free speech with absolutely no responsibility, i.e. hate speech, incitement to violence, then certainly in the case of Rwanda, that led to bloodshed. And I, I don't want to, you know, I want to be careful with this analogy, but when people were talking about Trump just uh, being able to say absolutely anything he wanted on Twitter, now, I don't for a second think America will end up in a situation like Rwanda. Not for a second, but um, absolute free speech is a naive concept. Free speech has always had the caveat of responsibility. That's why we have hate speech laws. Now, I think with hate speech laws, that like all laws, they have to be very, very closely scrutinised. Hate speech laws should not be used to trample legitimate criticism, for example, of ideology uh, or criticism of religion or anything like that. And I think in Britain, uh, and this is one of the criticisms of Hamza Yusuf in Scotland, he tried to introduce hate crime legislation that many considered basically de facto blasphemy laws. So there has to be freedom to criticize, criticize ideology. But the extreme example of free speech is Rwanda, because it is irrefutable that those who took our radio stations definitely played a role in the genocide. I'm not saying they alone caused it but they certainly i mean if you listen to the broadcasts and they're still available on the internet you know you can hear these they're sinister they would talk in jovial terms about cutting down the tall trees now this was a euphemism for massacring the tutsis they were said to be uh, taller uh, and it was an incitement to genocide so people who argue in absolute free speech with absolutely no responsibility that's extremely naive but I'm just going to close this by saying that um, if you can, this is a very good read, uh, An Ordinary Man, published in 2006, um, a couple of years after the film Hotel Rwanda, with Don Cheadle, Sophie Okinedo, and uh, directed by, um, directed by, um, who, his name temporarily eludes me, Harry George. Yeah, it's a good film worth checking out, and it, it was nominated for three Academy Awards. Um, but yeah, the, these developments with this, with what's happened to Rusapagina are quite disturbing. He doesn't deserve this. This is a man who saved hundreds of lives. And the fact that he's so humble shows that he's not, you know, cultivated his celebrity status. Um, sure, he's tried to do what's best for his country as he sees it, but this idea that he's funded terrorist organisations is baseless, and I think it's very obvious that this is a politically motivated um, trial, and, you know, Rwanda should free him immediately. Um, the danger with Kagame is he ends up just another African dictator. Well, he is a dictator, but, you know, Mugabe was held in high regard initially, and we know how that end ended up. And I think the danger of Rwanda, and he mentions this in his closing chapter, is when Rwandans don't speak to each other. 
So yes, there's reconciliation programs, but if people aren't speaking to each other, if there isn't dialogue, and I think if there isn't political plurality, that could breed resentment. Now, I'm not downplaying what Kagami has achieved, and I think it's important to recognise just how hellish Rwanda was in the summer of 1994. So the country has come a long way since then. But there are still problems, and this kind of transnational repression, that is to say harassing Rwandan dissidents abroad, it's it's not a good sign. I mean, some say that people like Paul Russell should begin, and this is an argument that's used, uh, are, there, are there interests really with the country? Words of patriotism. The fact is he left Rwanda reluctantly. He left because his life was threatened. Uh, and by extension, his family's lives, uh, his family members' lives. Um, so people need to understand that because the same smear was made against Chinese student leaders after Tiananmen Square. I've heard Chinese nationals say, oh, if they really love China, if they really had Chinese interests at heart, why did they go to the United States? Because they had no choice. Look at what happened to Alexei Navalny, right? Um, the argument was he's, you know, just working for the West because he he lives in Germany and he's, well, aside from the fact that he was poisoned by Putin's sh shadowy forces, you know, what happened when he went back to Russia? He was put on trial and he's now languishing in a prison cell. Dictators do not like different viewpoints. Um, and, you know, you can get benevolent dictatorship in the sense that they can do some good things. And I think this is Good description for Kagami, but as time goes on, you know, if he doesn't start to reform this, if he doesn't moderate and start to allow political plurality, I think resentments are going to build in Rwanda. And you know, the the thing that people need to remember or consider: the nineteen ninety four genocide wasn't the first act of violence between Hutus and Tutsis. In nineteen fifty nine, there was violence. There was violence after the Rwandan revolution, in neighbouring Burundi, twice, 1972 and 1993, there were mass killings. So this expression, never again, you might think that Rwanda's come a long way and it'll never happen again, but I think complacency would be a danger. Uh, you know, I give, I give Kagame credit. He has genuinely achieved a lot, but it's clear that he's a dictator and it's clear that this persecution of Brave men like Paul Russus of Begina is totally unwarranted. So um, that's a danger. Um, I think if Rwanda is truly to have a better future, uh, Kagame should moderate, basically, and start to allow more dissenting views. Then he will gain international praise. And, you know, the, the great example in Africa of a leader relinquishing power voluntarily is Nelson Mandela. But sadly, so many African leaders have squandered that potential and they've just clung on to power with absurd 95%, 100%, uh, you know, votes in their favour. So um, that's actually the other book I'm reading at the moment, uh, Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. So I've only just started it. But that should be insightful as well. Anyway, um, if you haven't read the book or you haven't seen the film, I recommend both highly. Um, very eye-opening. Uh, another film about that period is Shooting Dogs with John Hurt. Um, it's also worth seeing. Anyway, um, that's my thoughts. Rwanda is in a much better position it was in, but I think the complacency can be dangerous.